Hey, good morning, church. We're so glad you're here this morning. If you'd like to take communion with us later in the service, we have it available on the table over here right next to the offering boxes. At this time, I just want to direct your attention to the screen for our announcements, please. Good morning, Parkview. Welcome to Parkview. It's good to see you, Parkview. Here are a few announcements. Hey, are you new to Parkview Christian Church? Next Sunday, February 25th at noon, in our fireside room, we're going to be having a meal for anyone who is newer to Parkview. Uh, this is an opportunity for us as a staff and eldership to get to know you, you to get to know us, and find out some more information about Parkview and what we're really all about here. If you haven't signed up for that yet, make sure you talk to a staff member today or respond to Jamie's email as soon as possible. All right, guys, so today is the last day you can sign up for the Nerf Battle, which is happening tomorrow. From 11 to 2, it's President's Day, and as I said before, most kids should not have school that day, you know? Woo! So, if you need a break from your kids that day, still, or, you know, you have work, so you don't want the kids to be home alone, send them over to us for a few hours. We'll feed them, they'll get to attack each other, it's going to be a great time. Attention all men, if you've ever had the desire to preach the Word of God, Sunday, March 3rd, Right after the service and through the months of March and April, we're going to be offering a class that teaches you to do just that. How to write a sermon, how to put a sermon together, what are, what are hermeneutics, what are homiletics, what are all those things and how do they pertain to proclaiming God's word. We're going to talk about all that stuff and help you learn how to put together your own sermon by the end of that class. If you haven't signed up for it or if you're interested in it, get signed up at the connection area today or you can check out our website under member resources and sign up there as well. All 6th through 12th graders who are part of Parkview Christian Church, you are invited to our spring youth retreat. We are having it March 22nd to the 24th. It is $40 to go. It's at Camp Walk Atomica. It's going to be a fun time. There's going to be opportunities for hikes, opportunities for fishing, fellowship, fun games, all sorts of things. So if you want to get signed up, please, please uh, get, reach out to us or sign up online. Friday, March 15th, we are having our trivia night down at uh, Hebrews Coffee Shop in Shreve. This is, again, going to be a fundraiser to raise money for Rahab Ministries, one of the missions we support here at Parkview. Get your team together. You can have anywhere from three to five people on a team. Come up with a team name and sign up in the connection area as soon as possible. You can also do that as well on our website under member resources. If you have any questions, make sure you see me as soon as possible. Now please stand and join us for worship. <laughs> He's not right. <laughs> Yes. 
Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. All right. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you again to everyone who was a part of the chili cook-off last week. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support. And thank you to everyone who helped put that together. We were able to raise $824 uh, to go towards our mission trip this summer. So again, thank you for that. And also throughout the rest of this month, if you'd like to purchase a t-shirt from someone who's going on the trip or you just want to purchase one in general, there's a sign-up sheet inside the commons at the missions board. You can sign up in there or you can see anyone if you know someone who's going on the trip. Trip. You can seek them out personally to get one as well. But again, that's only happening until the end of February and beginning March 1st, we'll start placing the orders for the shirts that we have. You know, I, I can think there's one thing that we could all agree on for certain, and that is tragedy exists everywhere. You can't turn on the news without hearing about something tragic happening somewhere across the world. Just last Sunday, February 11th, in Texas, there was a shooting at a church. Two people were injured, and one person had their life taken. And no matter how you want to spin that, that's a tragedy. We would all agree with that. There's nothing good that comes out of that situation. That's bad for somebody. It's bad for the families of the people involved all the way around. Now, some tragedies aren't necessarily to that extreme, you know, but they're still tragedies nonetheless. You think about a marriage that's falling apart, a couple that's going to go through a divorce. That's a tragedy. You know, we don't want to see that happen. Or when someone loses a loved one in a car accident, that too could be considered a tragedy. You know, some tragedies, again, maybe some seem severe more than others, but the typical response from Christians during that time, when we know someone personally who's going through a very difficult time like that, the number one response is, how can I help you? You know, how can I help? And I think that's a good thing. That's a good question to ask. How can I help in, with you in the situation that you're in? What can I do to make that better? And according to Renew.org's website, I read an article on there this last week, and it said, and the question was, how can I help when tragedy strikes? The answer to that question is, will you pray for me? In fact, the article says the first and best response to disaster is, in fact, prayer. And I, you know, I would have to agree with that. You know, the reality is we may not be able to fix a broken marriage, but the truth is we can pray. We can pray for anybody, anytime, anywhere. And arguably, I would say prayer is the biggest and most popular discipline in all of Christianity because it's one that we can do, again, at any time we see fit. We can pray anywhere, any place. You know, we may not always have our Bible on us to be in the Word of God, which we should make that a priority on a daily basis. We may not always have our phone on us to look up Scripture. But no matter where we're at, we can always pray. But the real question is, do we actually know how to pray? And I'm not saying that to sound insulting to anyone by any means. You might be sitting there thinking, yes, of course I know how to pray. We're Christians. We know how to do this. We are the church. But do we know how to pray in a way that is God-honoring in the way that Jesus would want us to pray? I think it's a fair question to ask because when I look at the disciples, they were asking the same question of Jesus. They wanted to learn how to pray. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it even says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished... One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. You know, I always find it very interesting, or I used to find it very interesting. When I read that passage, all I can think is, how did these Jewish men not know how to pray? Like, I mean, come on. Jesus called them to follow him. At the very least, you would think they knew how to pray. And sure, in many ways they did. They knew how to clasp their, hand, their hands, bow their heads. They knew how to go through all the motions. But you got to think of what they always saw growing up. What did they see from the religious elite in their day, the Pharisees? They saw vain, repetitious prayers constantly being thrown up to the heavens. And a lot of them, like I said, were vain. They were self-centered. They were focused on self. But Jesus was praying in a way that was completely foreign to them. He was praying in a way that was so different. It was unlike anything they'd ever heard. And it was so foreign that they asked him, teach us to pray in the manner that you pray. For those of us who are joining us and might be here for the first time, we are in week three of a series where we're looking very closely at the template of prayer that we see outlined in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, and we know it as the Lord's Prayer. And the purpose of this series is not, uh, it's not so we can learn to repetitively say the Lord's Prayer. The fact of the matter is, most people in this room can probably say it from memory. We probably already know what it is, but do we know what we're actually saying? The purpose of this series is to teach us how to pray, 
how to pray in a way that is most honoring to God. And you might, again, it's not to be insulting to anyone. Someone might be sitting there thinking, you know, I've been praying for 50 years. Who are you to tell me that I don't know how to pray? I'm not saying you don't know how. I'm saying what we need to learn from this template is how to do it in a way that honors God the most. And two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus's warning label. We looked at the way that we're not to pray. We're not to pray like hypocrites. We're not to pray like pagans and just heap up meaningless, vain words to the heavens, just like the Pharisees were doing. And last week, we we were looking at Matthew 6, 9. We got into the first four words, our Father in heaven. The first four words of the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. And Father indicates to us that there is a relationship and that we are children of God if we are actually believers in Christ. In heaven, that reminds us that obviously we're not just praying to any father, but we're praying to a heavenly father. But now I want to look at the next four words that come in that prayer. Matthew 6, 9 says this, pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So again, he is a father who is in heaven, but before this prayer ever has a chance to get casual. And as I've said before, we are not to be casual when we come to God in prayer. In a father-child relationship, depending on your relationship with your earthly father, it can very easily be taken as, okay, this is casual. But before it ever has an opportunity to get that way, Jesus comes back and he says he is holy. We are declaring that God is holy because that's what hallowed means. And having an understanding of the significance of the word father when we say our father, that is huge, as we talked about last week. But he is a father who is holy. And just like when we have an understanding of what we're saying when we say our father in heaven, when we declare that God is holy, that should forever change the direction of our prayers. It should always change the way that we pray. You know, I've read where some Jewish people, in fact, a lot of Jewish people, they won't even speak or say the name God. Or Yahweh. They won't say it. And a lot of times they won't even spell it out. It would be G slash D. Or Yahweh would just be Y and H. Now to us, on the surface, we would look at that or hear that and think, that just sounds silly. Because I think I've mentioned God several times just in the time that I've been up here on stage. We've just sang songs about God. We've declared the name Jesus. We've said it several times. So we're thinking, why would they do that? Like, why would they go to that extent where they wouldn't even say his name? And the reasoning behind it and why they won't do it is because they recognize that humans are reckless with their speech. We are reckless with our speech. Have you ever been sarcastic and it hurt someone's feelings in the past? Have you ever lost your temper or said something to someone that you truly didn't mean? I think if we're honest, at one point or another, we could all find ourselves in that category. Humans are reckless with words and the Jews recognize this and they feel it better to not say God's name at all It's better to just not mention it rather than risk using it in an improper way because his name is holy. Hallowed be his name. I believe God wants us to know his name, but we should take care of that name because it is holy. We should always use that name in the proper context. And, you know, in regards to what is holy, there are other things in Scripture that we can look at and see that this is deemed to be holy by God. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12, we read this. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. You know, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day was deemed to be holy and to be set apart. It was to be uncommon and to be different. And now, in the New Testament, we get to the Christian era, Uh, Sunday is typically the day we look at and we say this is the day that is sacred. This is the day that is to be set apart. The difference between us and the Jews, I think if you ask most Christians, what do you do to really make the Sabbath day sacred in your life? Do you, is it sacred in your life? And you get a variety of answers of what people do, convictions that they have in regards to why they are how rather they keep it separate apart from all the other days of the week. You know, when I worked at a car wash over 20 years ago, I still remember, and I'll never forget this, this gentleman coming in, and I go out to take his money, and this was a Sunday afternoon, keep in mind. I go out to take his money, and as I go to take it, he pulls it away from me, and he said, if you don't start going to church, you're going to go to hell. I was like, that is the worst form of evangelism a person could ever use. I'm telling you, and I was like, what he didn't know is I actually was in a church service that morning. I only came in that afternoon because I knew those guys were busy, and they needed help. And so I told him, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to heaven because I was in church this morning. I took his money and walked away. And then I was just mad. The way my 19 to 20-year-old brain was working at that time is I'm washing his car. I'm thinking, 
The only reason I'm here is because of people like him who want their cars washed right now. So if I'm going to hell, it's his fault. You know, I didn't say that to him. I didn't say it to him, but I wanted to say that to him because that, again, that's what I was thinking. And, and for many years, that was over 20 years ago. And I'm still, and I still think about that, and I still believe, yes, that was a poor form of evangelism. And I knew then, and I know now, being in a church service does not secure your salvation. I knew that then, and I really know that now, and I would teach that now. But I'm thinking, where, but now I've started to think, where's this guy's thought process at, and why would he have said something like that? Because to him, and this is the admirable part, to him, the first day of the week was a non-negotiable for worshiping God. Now, I can admire that. And to him, this is what you had to do. Although I don't agree with his personal conviction about being in a church service and that's the only ticket to getting to heaven, I disagree with that. But to him, I got to admire his commitment to worship on the first day of the week. That's what we were supposed to do. And there's scripture that would back up his stance on that. Do not neglect meeting together, which is the habit of some, according to Hebrews chapter 10. It's biblical. So I can admire it, but we shouldn't take personal conviction about what we think is holy and shove it down someone else's throat when it's not even in the Bible. You know, another example, on the Sabbath day, there are some people that absolutely refuse to mow their yard. They're like, I am not mowing grass on Sunday. It just can't happen. I mean, all good Christians will refrain from mowing their grass on Sunday. Well, I got news for you. I'm going to tell you. When I mow, it is like the one time in my week, I guarantee that time of year at least, For 45 minutes, I can completely shut my brain off and not have to think about anything except straight lines. And they're not even that straight, and I don't care. I just want them to be, I just want the grass to be shorter than when I started. That's all I'm really looking for when I go to mow my yard. I try to be as straight as I can, but I don't have to think about anything else. So in sometimes, mowing my grass is a form of relaxation for me. Sometimes it's a chore and I don't want to do it, but not always. So if someone takes the stance that you can't mow on Sunday, that's their conviction. They should never shove that down someone else's throat as actually being true. And just by a show of hands, uh, how many people here can honestly say the primary reason they came to know Jesus Christ was because their neighbor didn't mow grass on Sunday? I didn't think so. That's, <laughs> I didn't think anybody would raise their hand to that because that's the truth. It's okay to have that kind of conviction. And if you're saying, you know what, this day is sacred and it's holy, and this is how I'm going to demonstrate it, Great. But if it's not biblical, don't shove it down someone else's throat. I do, as time goes by, more and more, I respect the opinions of people and the lengths they'll go to protect that which is holy, to keep that day sacred, to keep it set apart. There's other days throughout the year. You know, there's anniversaries. We hold those as sacred. At least we should, gentlemen. We should hold those days as sacred. You know, there's uh, birthdays, there's holidays, there's so many different days, not just in the week, but in the year, that are set apart and we don't negotiate them. But church, understand this. The name of God is not common either. The name of God is sacred. He is holy. It is set apart. Hallowed be his name. I could talk all day about the word holy and what it should actually mean to us. But instead, what I really want to do to get the point across is to look at the experience the prophet Isaiah had in the Old Testament, when he encountered the presence of God, he understood more in that moment than most people will ever understand what the holiness of God is truly all about. When we, are, when we understand what he saw and what he experienced, that's when we understand what, that's when we'll truly understand what we're saying when we say, hallowed be his name. It'll take on a whole new meaning to us when we understand what God's holiness is really all about. And so there's three things I want to look at in regards to what God's holiness is tells us. And the first one is, God is separate from us. God is separate from us. And in other words, like I said earlier, God is set apart. He is set apart from humanity. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, we read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
You know, in the verses that we just read there, I think this is the image we need to have of God when we decide to come to him in prayer. The Lord sitting on a throne and the train of his robe filling the entire room. The seraphim or the angels flying all around him, covering not just their feet but their faces. What that tells us is that these supreme creatures that dwell with God are humbling themselves because they know they're in the presence of a holy God, God Almighty. But more than just their actions, it's what they were declaring with their mouths at that time that was important too. And we just read it in verse 3. I'll read verse 3 again. They were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, there was a lady one time that I was friends with on Facebook. And she didn't do this with every post, but it was a frequent thing that she would do from time to time. She would type out one, two, maybe even three paragraphs of something, and it would be in all caps. All capital letters. Now, she didn't do it enough with every post, so it didn't always uh, seem just like the norm, but it would catch your attention. And I always thought, why is she doing that? It just seems like someone's screaming at me through my computer. Like, what is she trying to do? And the reality is, she was trying to get your attention. There was something she was saying, and she wanted everybody to stop and read that. There are many ways people try to get their point across sometimes. Sometimes it's by simply raising their voice. And sometimes it's by simply screaming. But some people we use repetition. And as I've said before, repetition in prayer can be a bad thing. You know, but in this instance here, what we see from these angels, we're seeing an example, not just meaningless repetition and heaping up meaningless words before God, but we're seeing that they're putting an emphasis on how special and how holy this God really is. Holy, holy, holy is God Almighty. Imagining this scene, how God is on the throne, how the angels respect him so much that they cover their faces and they repeat those words declaring God is holy. It reminds me that God is separate from all of humanity, that God is above me. Remembering this scene when I speak the words, hallowed be your name, can change the way that I pray forever. It should change the way that I pray forever. It keeps me from ever being too casual with my words and or with my approach. And it completely removes self from the equation. There's no room for me to just seek the things that which I want the most. And when we say Lord, or when we say God in our prayers, may that remind us that we are not speaking just an ordinary name. It's not about that. Because God is not ordinary. He is a holy God who is separate from humanity. The second thing that we learn from God's holiness is this. It's, I have sinned. And this is probably the least popular of the three things we can learn about God's holiness, but we get reminded of our sin. In Isaiah 6, verses 4 through 5, we wrote, he wrote this. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do we really know how we would respond uh, if we walked into the presence of Jesus? You know, I mean, the, the song that always comes to mind is, I can only imagine by mercy me. You know, do we really know how we're going to respond when we step into the presence of a holy God? And a lot of people would say, you know, I don't know. I would have to, it'll have to happen when I'm there. I, I won't know until I'm in the situation. And that's fair. I can respect that. But in Scripture, we do see different reactions that people give. And it could have been some of the inspiration for this song as well. Some people fall down. Some people completely bow down in worship. Some people raise their hand. And in some cases, like Isaiah, some people, they confess their sins. And we see angels hiding their faces from God. And Isaiah quickly realizes that he doesn't belong there, that he's not worthy of being in their presence. And what he confesses is, he confesses that he has unclean lips. In other words, he has had reckless speech, and he has lived that way. And he's even saying, the people that I've surrounded myself with, the people that I live with, they have reckless speech too. And he's not really throwing them under the bus, but what he is declaring is that he is not worthy of being where he is at in this moment. And the way Isaiah presents the presence of God is the very presence would almost seem fatal to a sinner. It would make them want to change and want, make them want to change right now. It's interesting here that Isaiah uses his speech 
as the source of his sinfulness. And when I, when I read that, I have to stop and think. I go back over my life. The majority of the sin that I have probably committed in my lifetime was likely done with my speech. And, you know, and, and I see that. It's like, you know, have you ever said something to someone out of anger? Absolutely. Have I ever said things jokingly that have offended people? Absolutely. Whether it's right or wrong, whether no matter what the intention is, if I'm hurting someone, that's an example of unclean lips. And it reminds me again, why do the Jews not speak the name of God? Because humans are reckless with their speech in more than one way. And therefore, sin is one of the very things that can come from our speech over and over. When I pray with my mouth, hallowed be your name, I am declaring with my lips that God is holy and I am not. That he is separate from me, he is holy and I am not. When I say those words, I am reminded of the grace that I so desperately needed from Jesus Christ for him to come and to wear my sin, my shame on a cross and die for me so that I could find eternal life through him and him alone. His holiness, God's holiness, reminds me that I am a sinner and I need saved. And the third thing that I want to look at is that we should serve others. That's the last thing that God's holiness should remind us of, that we should serve other people. In Isaiah 6, verses 6 through 8, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. His sin was atoned for, and now he is prompted to serve this holy God as a prophet. You know, so many times when we come to God in prayer, prayer is seen nothing more. It's seen as nothing more than just a time where we come seeking the things that we want the most. Things that, if we're honest, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, are things that are only going to bring us temporary happiness. And some of our prayers, even though they may be about self or things that we want, they're not all bad. If we're praying for God to restore someone's marriage, that's not a bad prayer. If we're praying for comfort for someone who lost a loved one in an automobile accident, that's not bad. But Isaiah reminds us in these passages, when we pray, we are praying to a holy God that is set apart from us, who is pure and has never sinned like us, but can take away our sins, can atone for our sins, and is a God who prompts us into service for his kingdom. His holiness reminds us to serve other people in his name. What kind of service? What kind of service are we to be prompted into? What is our mission statement at Parkview? Therefore, go and make disciples. It is the great commission given to us by Jesus. In other words, we serve people by leading them to Christ. And that can only be done if we do what? If we choose to live different, live a different lifestyle, not be content to play church, but to live different and be the church and make disciples. And the I and live stands for invest. We, when we serve people, we invest in them. And I'm not just talking about just monetarily. I'm saying I'm talking about intentionally investing in their spiritual growth. Spending time going through the word of God and studying it with someone. Maybe an unbeliever showing them the steps of salvation and how to find Jesus Christ. Inviting them to come and worship with you on a Sunday morning. Making that a priority so that you, the church, are carrying out that mission statement. I've heard it said that when we pray... Our prayer should be so strong that it prompts us into kingdom service. And we can't help but want to intentionally serve this holy God. But again, I would say it all depends on, do we really know how to pray? Do we know how to pray properly and do we know who we're praying to? What is the focus of our prayers? Do our prayers remind us only of the things that we want? Or a holy God that desperately wants the world to know him and all about his holiness. I'll have the praise band come on back up. When we understand these three realities, church, God is set apart and that we have sinned and that God will equip us to invest in others so that they can experience the same holiness that we've experienced to some degree, it should change the way we go to him in prayer now and forever. It should direct most, if not all, of the prayers we will ever 
pray in our lifetime. Some people likely realize this, and some people may not, and that's okay either way. But it's obvious when you get into the Lord's Prayer, if you know it by heart, there comes the part where you start saying, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for our trespasses. You know, God is specifically telling us things that we should be asking for for ourselves. And we'll talk about that at a later time. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. But we look at those as petitions, not necessarily declarations. And when we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we say that part, hallowed be your name, that is not necessarily a declaration about who God is. It's actually the first petition and or request in the Lord's Prayer. We're saying we want you, God, to reveal yourself, reveal your holiness to mankind. And I think minister and author, Southern, or he's a Southern Baptist preacher, Albert Moeller, he describes it like this. When Jesus petitions God to hallow his name, he is asking that God act in such a way that he visibly demonstrates his holiness and his glory. When we recite the Lord's Prayer, it can be easy just to skip over this part. Not skip over it, but just go right through it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then just your kingdom come, your will be done, and just carry on. And we see it as nothing more than a declaration and not a request. But it is a request. We are requesting that this holy God reveal himself so that others may see that he is set apart. So that other people may see that they have sinned and they need rescued by Jesus Christ. And so that others can be prompted into serving in his name. And through us, how can people see the holiness of God? Well, the Holy Spirit dwells in the members of his church. Let God see the holiness and how great he really is through how you choose to live your life for him. Are these the things you think of when you say the words, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we fully understand what we're saying, and ultimately who we're saying it to, it changes everything. It'll forever change the way that we pray. And in regards to being able to say our Father, as we talked about last week, that is reserved for the children of God. That is who God listens to. Those are the prayers that he listens to. Those who are his children and belong to him and him alone. And this morning, if you are not in that category, if you do not consider yourself a child of God, you've not surrendered your life to him, You've never decided to say, you know what, I want to live for him. I want to be baptized. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And this is a time for you. And I would encourage you to make that known today, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's a hallowed name, a holy name. And what a privilege it is that he gives us to say his name with reverence, to confess it so we can come to him. If that's you this morning and you have a decision to make for him, please come forward as we stand and sing. shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble and your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out God, we will. 
So this is Crystal. I just want to, and what's your last name, Crystal? Boynson. So I just met Crystal this morning, and she's come forward and said that she would like to be baptized. However, she did not bring a change of clothes with her. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to plan to do that at 1 o'clock this afternoon uh, right here. This is an exciting thing, Crystal. We're happy for you. I'm going to get your uh, confession of faith, and we'd love to pray with you before we go into our time of communion. So just repeat after me. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. And He is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Almighty God, what an exciting moment this is. God, I thank you for Crystal, and I thank you for her decision to want to follow you and to follow through and be obedient in baptism and receive your Holy Spirit. This is a day to celebrate, this is a day to remember now and always. We thank you for her, her life, her decision, and I pray that we as a church can always be an encouragement to her now and always. We love you, and above all, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. Yep. Good morning. The angels are rejoicing today for the addition of a new soul into the kingdom. Crystal, welcome. 30 years ago today, February 18th, 1994, my wife Carolyn and I went on our first date. It's been an interesting journey. When my mom introduced us, I looked at her and said, that's the one. I found it later from her, she looked at me and said, oh, okay. And um, I spent, uh, spent a lot of time just trying to keep, keep her interested in me. I actually, um, actually borrowed $10 from her and put off paying it back so she'd actually come up and talk to me. <laughs> uh, young man out there, uh, I don't recommend this in the courting ritual, but it worked out for me, so I guess it's okay. Thank you, honey. I love you. We all have journeys that we take which require a first step. For me, it was borrowing 10 bucks in this case. But the first step we take on our journey with Jesus is to say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I take him as my Lord and Savior. One of my professors down at Harding told me nobody really understands what that means when we take that first step. Just like a marriage, just like a friendship, just like a family, it's going to wind and turn and it's going to have its ups and downs. But ultimately, it's going to work out for the best for us. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3 says this. Such a large crowd of witnesses is all around us, so we must get rid of everything that slows us down, 
especially the sin that just won't let go. And we must be determined to run the race that is ahead of us. We must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to a cross because he knew later he would be glad he did. Now he is seated at the right side of God's throne. So keep your mind on Jesus who put up with many insults from sinners. Then you won't be discouraged and give up. Our journey with Jesus started with a confession of faith. Jesus' journey started 2,000 years ago. When he gave his life, he endured the shame of dying on a cross to save each and every one of us from ourselves, from the sins that we commit every day. At this time, we have a service we call the service of communion, where we take a piece of bread and some grape juice and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, giving up his body and blood to cleanse us from our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. We thank you that we were able to open our eyes, take a breath, and come to this place. Father, there are so many things you do for us that we couldn't possibly ask or imagine. We would literally be nothing if you did not hold us in the palm of your hand and keep us together. Father, we thank you for this country we live in, which allows us the freedom to do what we're doing right now, to learn about you, to sing praises, to pray, to have this service without fear of persecution as so many of our brothers and sisters have, where they give up to their lives for the honor of proclaiming your name. We thank you for the men and women who have given up to their lives to protect those freedoms. Father, we thank you for the journey that your son Jesus has gone on with us who have claimed his name. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made so that we may take that journey to one day end up with you in paradise. We ask that you bless this time now, make our thoughts pure as we go into this time of communion. Father, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory, and we thank you, especially for the sacrifice made by your son Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.
Something I something I want to share real quick, and you know, just with everything that's happened so far here this morning, um, just to be completely transparent. This past week, I'm not gonna lie, it was a rough week. I'm not saying this to complain, but I just I struggled this past week with no, a number of things. One of which is my cat's missing. If you see it, bring it home. That'd be great. Um, but that's just one one issue. The main issue that I was having this past week is, man, this sermon was not coming together for me at all. Even by Thursday morning, I'm still, like, trying to work through it in my head. I'm like, it's not coming together like I feel like it should. Usually by Thursday morning, I've got a firm grasp on the things that I want to preach on and what direction I'm going. I had a couple of different outlines uh, typed up, and I was like, nope, this isn't working. This doesn't work for me. This isn't going to, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't fit. But then by the time Sunday rolls around, everything's ready to go, and it worked. And somebody at the right time apparently needed to hear what God had to communicate, and they gave their lives to Christ. And I think it's, it's not about me. This is just a reminder that that's exactly how God works, and I think that's incredible. And so, Crystal, we're excited for you. This is an exciting thing. Um, and I did mention, you know, one of the key ways is leading people to Christ. You bring them to worship with you. Thank you, Charles and Tyler, for bringing her to worship with you this morning. I mean, everything tied together and came together for the reason, for a reason, and may God get all the glory for that. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're going to go ahead and we'll just close out with prayer. Almighty God, hallowed be your name. May we always come before you with complete reverence. From this day forward, may we never say the Lord's Prayer without recognizing just how truly great you are, how great your name truly is. I thank you for all you've done for us, all you've done through humanity simply by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to make eternal life possible through the shedding of his blood. We thank you for him, and now and always, it'll be in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone. Cause we were the best